Danica Lohr, and this is Lit Happens, your celebration of the literary arts here in Saskatchewan. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome David Carpenter. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Now, I've followed you for a long time, as long as I've been reading Saskatchewan literature, so I'm, I'm really pleased to have you today. Tell me a little bit about what led you to want to be a writer. I guess it started with reading and, and, um, and some very good teachers. Um, I, I, I had a, an English prof who escaped from Vienna when the Nazis were descending, a Jewish man named Henry Kreisel, and he would read from Yeats and he'd read from Joyce and Virginia Woolf and he'd read. And uh, um, I was in my early 20s uh, and it was like being awake for the first time. Everything before that was sleep. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to be as close to these writers as I could. And finally I said, oh, okay, I'll be a teacher. And I was a teacher for, for several years, a high school teacher in Edmonton. And then um, I wanted to get closer to these writers, so I uh, went to grad school and got my PhD and became uh, a professor, and I thought that this is where I really belong. But uh, and I love the teaching, but I still think I wanted to get closer to these writers, to the magic that they do. So the university sent me to Texas uh, on a research mission in the summer. Imagine Austin, Texas, <laughs> in the summer. So I couldn't leave my room; it was too hot, and so I had to stay in the air conditioning and. And I had virtually nothing to do because I'd been reading all day. So I thought I'd write some letters. And one of the letters turned out to be very long. And once I had sent the letter, I thought, that's probably a story, that letter. And so I spent 17 nights and two weekends writing um, a novella. It's the worst novella ever written by a Canadian. But, but the process of creating these characters was just beyond therapeutic it was ecstatic I thought this is the only thing I ever want to do and unfortunately I already had a job to do so the idea was how to quit and when to quit so that I could begin writing full-time and that took quite a few years but uh, it was the best decision I ever made I think and you came to Saskatoon still as a university professor that's right and yeah. then you sort of really became part of the writing community. That's right. I, I came, uh, I just finished a couple of years as a postdoc. I started teaching on campus in 1975 and, uh, and then I, I heard a poetry reading from the Moose Jaw Movement. I heard Gary Hyland and Bob Curry and, and all kinds of wonderful writers, Lorna Crozier, and uh, I thought, wow, what a community. And so uh, that's when um, I also met Anne Magalski, and she said, David, you should go to Fort Sand where you'll learn how to write. <laughs> you really need that. And I, I, I don't think it was an indication of my talent. It was, <laughs> it was an indication of how much I needed to learn. Because when you go through academia, you learn one way of writing. And to be a writer, you have to unlearn an awful lot of that, that way of putting words on the page. And so you, you, you saw these people read poetry, and now, now they're, they're friends of yours, and, and some of them were, were quite dear to you. How, how has that affected you as a writer, to have a community like that? Well, it's, it's, um, it's wonderful to have that kind of community because, um, well, I'll, I'll just give you one practical reason. The social reasons don't have to be stated. <laughs> they're, they're a lot of fun. But... Uh, when, when I've finished a manuscript that I've been working on for a very long time, uh, the, the, the moment comes when I really have to show it to someone. I show it first to honor. She's my wife and she's my number one reader. And then, and then I take it over to the, the meanest friend I, I know. And uh, obviously that's Dave Margot. <laughs> I was going to say that. And uh, I try to be as mean as he is when he shows me his manuscripts. Um, we, we try to be very mean indeed. I think he beats me out <laughs> each time. And uh, the, the community is filled with people who were, um, uh, who are just very, very good support. Uh, and uh, um, I, I, I keep hearing 
other writers from other constituencies, other regions, other parts of the country who uh, envy the Saskatchewan community because it's, it is so very supportive. And it's mean when it has to be. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is supportive, and it's supportive of people at all levels and at, in all genres, even mm -hmm. as a storyteller. And Dave Margotius, he can be tough, but he can be very kind, too, and oh, yeah. very supportive. Yeah. He's, uh, he's been very good to me in, in uh, Yeah, in, he's in, a when, terrific when he reader as well as a terrific writer, and he knows the profession inside out, mm -hmm. so he gives great advice. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today was your book and uh, this one, one of your books, you have, you have many, The Education of Augie Moracity. Now this book is a story, but it also has a great story behind us. So yes, can you tell us true, a little yes. bit about that? Yeah, it does. I, I have to be very careful not to call it my book because Augie's the one who suffered for this story and Augie's the one who, uh, who wrote me many, many letters so that I could put the story together. Um, over a period of 14 years, I might add. Um, so uh, I guess it started with a phone call from the English department. By then I was a full-time writer and they assumed I had therefore had nothing to do. <laughs> so uh, uh, Nick Thompson from the office said, uh, there's a letter I think you should read. And the letter was from Augie Marasti. Uh, at that time he was a trapper, about 76 years old. And uh, he'd, he'd been through a traumatic experience at residential school up north. And uh, uh, this was during the 1930s and 40s. Um, and uh, he, he wanted someone um, to go up there and tape record him and write down his story for him. And uh, it, it turned out that was going to be impossible because there was no place to stay and there was no electricity or anything. So I got him to write letters to me. And uh, some of these letters uh, were, were uh, very long, full of details, and he would enclose big chunks of, of stories. And sometimes these stories would start in the middle or end in the middle, mm -hmm. or you'd get tatters of stories, or you'd get stories told several times. And at my job as, as his, uh, as I, I, I saw him as, I, I was his personal secretary my job was to try and find the clearest version of the story where clarity is, is all in this business and cobble together that story from all of the versions uh, and then, of course, ask him questions about it, what happened where and, and that sort of thing. The problem I was up against, though, was not that I don't like to edit stuff um, or piece stories together. That, that's interesting. The problem was uh, he was a severe alcoholic and most of the time uh, living in his car or living on the street. Imagine 80 years old and you're still living in the street. But uh, So after a while the letters stopped coming after seven years, no more letters. And I thought he was dead because he wouldn't answer phone calls, wouldn't answer my letters. And I tried to find somebody who might have known him way up north or perhaps in PA. And, and I couldn't get anything. So um, finally, 2013, I went down to the, uh, the Stegner house with, with Honor, and she worked on a painting, and I worked on this, this book, and I finished it. And I said, well, well, Augie, wherever you have fallen, I've mm -hmm. done it, and I'm going to send it to a publisher. So, so will you release me? <laughs> and I sent it off to a publisher. They promptly rejected it because they were the content is really shocking, mm -hmm. and they were afraid that uh, there would be too many lawsuits. So um, I sent it to another publisher. I'm, I met him. I met Bruce Walsh in Regina at a, at a conference, and I found out how, how gutsy he is and how intelligent and how connected to the publishing world he is. And he's Regina's own Bruce Walsh. <laughs> we, he's ours. <laughs> he's he's a, a nonfiction writer's dream come true. So he said, um, David, we're looking for Saskatchewan manuscripts, so we're not getting much. We're getting them from everywhere else, but we're not getting much from Saskatchewan. And I said, oh, I just happen to have a manuscript. And uh, again, I didn't think it would get published. Maybe it was too short, for one thing. I sent it off to him, and three weeks later, he phoned me and said, David, we want to publish your book. And how often does a writer get that? I mean, usually you wait years, if not many months. And, uh, and he, was, 
he not only wanted to publish my book, he wanted to do it willingly. <laughs> he was really, really keen on it. And still, I didn't think it would sell because it was too odd. It wasn't, I'd never done anything like it before. And, and, uh, and it, it seemed to me that uh, it was too short for anybody to consider a, re a decent gift at Christmas time. And, and I was just completely wrong. But before the book get published, I had to get Augie to sign a contract. And I said, I said Bruce, he's got to be dead. You're, what? And he said, I don't care, David. You've got to find him, <laughs> to see, at least to see if, if, give me a grave site, you know. And so I began these trips up to Prince Albert, to the, uh, uh, the Friendship Center, and, 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 and all kinds of, uh, of uh, areas of, uh, 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 of uh, PA where a, a lot of First Nations people live and 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 uh, I my routine would be I would I try really hard not to sound like a policeman um, and I would try really hard not to sound sort of sleazy you know Augie Morasti I, I tried to be just sort of uh, uh, somewhere in between those two extremes and one day I met a Métis couple, an old couple, sitting on a park bench. I said, do you know Augie Morasti? And, and the fellow wanted to know why I wanted to find him. He wanted to vet me. And then he said, you see that bus over there? And the bus was pulling off. Yes, yes. Augie Morasti's in that bus with that woman. <laughs> that seemed to be a story in itself. I said, what, 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 where's the bus going? And he said, west. <laughs> so I ran very hard to get my car, to find the bus and follow the bus, and I lost it. I, mm. I couldn't find it. But finally, a temp working at the Friendship Center, a woman who just worked on weekends, said, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but Augie, you might find him in detox. And so from Saskatoon, I phoned Detox, and there he was. He was alive. And uh, I had to find a way of getting to him in Detox, because he always left early in the morning mm -hmm. to get back on the street. So I got up about 4 in the morning and drove to PA, and I grabbed him before he could escape <laughs> me. And he signed the contract. Wow. And, and has he, did he enjoy the the um, the fame that came with the book. And I, I think is yes, absolutely. Um, he's part of uh, uh, this huge Morasti clan in the north, and they're very successful people. But but his branch uh, had had difficulties, and uh, they they didn't understand why Augie was such a black sheep, was such a drunk, such a terrible father. You know, he would say, you know, I'm writing a book. Oh yeah, sure, yeah, you're writing a book. And then the book came out, and people at Detox said, you, you mean he's got a real book? I said, yeah, yeah, here's the contract. You've got to sign it. And suddenly he starts getting interviewed on the CBC, and he starts getting interviewed in newspapers. And the Globe, when the book comes out, the Globe does this long piece on him, and, and so does the Toronto Star, so does the National Post, and, and then... And then uh, um, uh, National CBC gets us on, and people who used to spurn him now started to take him in. They'd see him stumbling down the street. They'd say, "Come home with us, and we'll, you know, we'll help you, you know, get sober." And he would allow this to happen for a couple of days, and then he'd be back in the street mm -hmm. again. But the community embraced him, and. Uh, he, his, one of his daughters got him into an old folks home where there's no drinking allowed. Mm. And he, he looks fabulous. He's 80, almost 87, and he looks terrific. Wow. Which isn't fair. <laughs> well, you still look terrific, Dave. And you know what? We're out of time today. Oh. I really appreciate having you on the show today. Just tell us where we can find your books. Uh, McNally Robinson has most of the recent ones, and uh, University of Saskatchewan Bookstore We'll also have uh, some of those books, too, so wherever is closest. Thank you, David. Thanks for being on the show today. You're very welcome. I'm Danica Lohr, and this is Lit Happens. You can find past episodes on Shaw TV Saskatoon's YouTube channel. 
You can contact me on Twitter or Facebook or by emailing danikalor at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.